HIV has spread to every country in the world, but the countries of East and Southern Africa are most severely affected. This region is home to little more than 2% of the world's population, but nearly half of new HIV cases occur here each year. Millions of people have died of AIDS in this part of the world, and millions of children have lost their parents to the disease. This calamity has been attributed to many things, including poverty, prostitution, conflict, migration, and lack of education and knowledge. Are these assumptions true? You see, uh, all uh, the factors that you mentioned contribute to the uh, epidemic. Uh, they can, however, they can entirely explain the high HIV rate in this part of the world, in, in Africa. For example, sex work is uh, everywhere in the world. It uh, can get sex workers in Asia, Europe, and America, often in greater numbers than uh, uh, in Africa. And studies from Southern African countries uh, showed that men they aren't especially likely to uh, visit sex workers as compared to other men in the rest of uh, the world. Poverty is one of the factors that we, sh we should consider in the HIV uh, transmission. Poverty is an important factor and it makes dealing with HIV very difficult. But the relationship between poverty and HIV is complicated, as you know. For example, many poor countries in uh, Asia and Latin America have low HIV rates. And even within Africa, the most severely affected countries are the richer ones, like South Africa and Botswana. The evidence that HIV rates are high in Africa because of foreign migration is also unclear. In fact, none of these factors in themselves seems to explain why HIV rate is high in Eastern and Southern Africa. There must be some other reasons. One risk factor that you might not be aware of is concurrent or overlapping sexual partnerships. Such relationships can put people at risk even when they have very few partners, as Helen Epstein, an expert in the field, explains. Studies show that uh, African people probably don't have more sexual partners over a lifetime uh, than people in other parts of the world do. However, there may be in some societies a greater tendency for people to have um, a small number, perhaps two or three ongoing sexual partnerships that that uh, may overlap in time for months or years. So for example, a man may have a wife and a girlfriend or two wives, and one of those women may have another partner somewhere. He may have another partner, or perhaps two, and so on. And if enough people are doing this, it can give rise to a vast interlocking network of sexual relationships that uh, can serve as a kind of super highway for the spread of HIV. The important thing to realize about this is that this network um, can put many, many people at risk, even if they don't have large numbers of sexual partners and uh, even if they have only one. These illustrations show a hypothetical network of concurrent sexual relationships. The men and women are all linked up to each other through stable, ongoing relationships. No one is switching partners, and no one has very many partners. But when HIV is introduced into the network, it spreads very quickly. Of course, concurrent partnerships occur everywhere. Uh, but in parts of the world where HIV rates tend to be lower, we tend to see a prevailing pattern of serial monogamy, where people have one partner at a time uh, and then uh, may switch uh, after some period, perhaps weeks, months, or years. Um, and you can uh, accumulate a pretty big number of partners over a lifetime this way, but it tends to be much safer uh, for this when it comes to the spread of HIV. These diagrams show a group of serial monogamists who switch from one exclusive partnership to another. Observe how HIV spreads much more slowly than it did through the concurrency network even though these serial monogamists are switching partners more often. Because serial monogamists aren't linked up in a network, the virus has to wait until an infected couple breaks up before it can spread further. So how do these different relationship patterns affect the spread of HIV? Let's take a look at this cartoon. At the beginning, both groups have no HIV, but over time, the concurrency group has significantly more infections compared to the serial monogamy group. In this way, concurrency allows HIV to spread as though it were on a superhighway.
Another factor that makes concurrency more dangerous than serial monogamy has to do with the way the virus behaves in the blood of an infected person. Right after a person becomes infected with HIV, the virus reproduces very rapidly in the blood for about a month. At this time, the number of viruses, or what doctors call the viral load, is very high. Then the person's immune system starts fighting the virus. Antibodies, which are Y-shaped molecules and so-called killer cells, attack the viruses and manage to kill some of them, bringing the viral load down. Viral load is important because the more virus there is in the blood, the more likely someone is to spread the virus to someone else. This means that people are very infectious in those weeks or months right after they have been newly infected themselves. It's important to know that most HIV tests detect antibodies to HIV, not the virus itself. So during this early, highly infectious phase, a person won't even show up positive on a test. The viral load increase right after infection is important because it makes concurrency even more dangerous compared to serial monogamy. With concurrency, high viral load is sustained as the virus spreads through the network from one person to another. When this man becomes infected, he will pass the virus on to this woman right away while his viral load is still high. This woman, now newly infected, will sleep with her other partner when her viral load is still high, heightening the risk of transmission in that relationship. This man, in turn, is sleeping regularly with three other women, and he is likely to sleep with each of them when his viral load is still high, so he is very likely to infect all three of them, and so on. If our serial monogamous couple gets infected, they will stay with each other for months or years, by which time they will have passed through the period of high viral load. When they break up, they will be much less infectious, and thus less likely to pass the virus on to their new partners. Multiply this pattern across a whole population, and we can see how HIV prevalence would be much lower. Now that we know about the concurrency superhighway, what can we do about it? And how can we protect ourselves from HIV infections?